Okay, I guess I, we can start on time today. Uh, thank you all for coming again after all the problems we had yesterday installing the tool. Um, as I said in the email you might have received uh, last night, uh, for the people who stayed, uh, we were able to solve all the issues. And then we only had uh, one outstanding problem. Uh, Bakir uh, solved it uh, himself last night. someone else faces the same issue. Um, and uh, for, for the ones of you who still have uh, outstanding installation issues, we can stay afterwards uh, for 10 to 15 minutes trying to, to get everything to work. Um, I hope that we can, we can solve everything today before the end of the day. So this is my plan for the session. Uh, yesterday, I stopped right before talking about the sum model, so that's going to be my first uh, point today. Uh, then I'm going to talk a bit about getting the sum or the I.O. table ready to work. Uh, so that means if uh, there's any type of changes that needs to be made to the sum, like uh, reordering accounts, probably aggregating, balancing, uh, getting the sum ready uh, for simulations. Uh, then some uh, basic descriptive uh, figures that are produced uh, by the tool, let's say before computing the inverse and, and, and doing some more sophisticated analysis. Uh, we'll spend a fair amount of time talking about the inverse and analysis using the inverse matrix. Um, we'll talk also about the price model. Uh, you saw on the main sheet that there's a module dedicated to the price model. Um, we're going to see then how to design experiments for both quantity and price models. And finally, uh, we're going to spend a fair amount of time talking structural path analysis. That's my plan for today. Uh, but before we start, yesterday someone asked a very good question by the end of the session. Um, the question is, well, let's assume that I have more categories than that. Right? Uh, for some reason, I want to add, I don't know, a third institution, for example. Uh, if, for example, divide the enterprises uh, in for-profit and, and not-for-profit enterprises, for example. Uh, the question is, should I then add a column, oh, I'm sorry, a row to this to these sheet? Add a row to add the, the extra institution I have? And the answer is always no. No, you cannot delete nor add rows to this sheet. Again, um, the labels are only auxiliary um, information for your simulations, mostly. So if you group, let's assume you have uh, for-profit and not-for-profit enterprises, the fact that you group those two as a single in a single category doesn't really affect any of your simulation, just for informational purposes. So please never add or delete rows to these. I don't know what's going to happen, uh, but I assume it's not going to be good. So please don't try that here. Do you have a question? That's exactly the point, right? That's exactly the point. It's the same as labor, right? You see that you have four categories of labor. So instead of trying to add a row that says female or, or male labor, well, just uh, tell the tool that you have four or two different categories of labor. That's exactly the way to do it. Um, OK, so this is, this is uh, there. Do not delete rows, but I should add. Do not add rows, either. I will. Um, okay, that's point number one. Point number two, I guess uh, I exaggerated yesterday when I said, well, you can write the name of your girlfriend uh, is, instead, of, instead of, of these labels. Even though that's, strictly speaking, is true, there is one caveat. 
Uh, when you do simulations, uh, you see exactly uh, what type of, of uh, simulation. But uh, usually the first group is assumed to be activities, the production block, activities and commodities. So if you, for example, decide to have the first, the, the production block right here, uh, that might cause um, some confusion later during simulations. So I ask, I ask that you keep the production block on top of your sample, and, and you'll see why. But the, the general idea, I think, is still valid, right? This, this is purely informational. There's no real effect in changing, in changing any of this. Um, oh, and another important thing, when you're going to see that the tool computes automatically the macro sum, uh, and the macro sum, the definition for the tool of the macro sum is, this, is the aggregated sum using these categories, right? So it doesn't matter what your categories mean, but when the tool computes the macro sum, it uses exactly those categories. Concretely, it's going to compute some subtotals for activities using the first 15 accounts. Another subtotal for commodities using the next 15, and so on. Uh, so if you are working, um, uh, for example, with uh, macroeconomic aggregates, and you need consistency after you input the data, of course using, using uh, meaningful labels is going to help a lot. Identify clearly the imports, uh, exports, GDP, and so on. Okay. I guess that's it for the for inputting data. Um, let's talk a bit about the SUM model, even though most of you are, are, are pretty familiar. Uh, and you know, five minutes talking about this. Um, the SUM is not a model, right? The SUM is just a schematic presentation of flows in an economy. Uh, but it can be turned into a model. And the way it is done is, uh, it is assumed that all agents or institutions in the average expenditure propensities, right? So that means that if uh, agriculture uses 20% per, uh, of its uh, intermediate consumption uh, from itself, then it doesn't matter what type of shock uh, the, I apply to the economy, this percentage is going to remain the same. And the same is true for households and every, every single account uh, in the metrics. Uh, so again, these propensities are usually assumed to be unaffected by shocks, uh, even though we can relax that assumption and um, uh, we can change the propensities. I'll tell you what, uh, how later. Um, another assumption is that all sectors and factors uh, exhibit excess capacity. So if I uh, double the production of agriculture uh, in my economy, then I can uh, hire twice as many workers, right? And, and they, they will be available. Um, assumption can be relaxed using the tool, and we will do it tomorrow uh, uh, using supply constraints. But this is, again, just a basic version of the model. Uh, this is a schematic representation. Uh, I drew this from uh, the Fournier and Thorbeck. Um, we have a block of endogenous, let's say, I have a, a distinction of endogenous and exogenous accounts. And then, uh, let's say, the intersection of endogenous accounts uh, in the sum is going to be denoted. The other, the other conventions we, we're going to use. Um, I guess we all know the metrics of uh, technical coefficients is the result of dividing every cell in the metrics by the, um, let's say, column total. Um, um, and then 
Uh, total income for endogenous accounts. This is only the endogenous component of that, of that income, and this is the exogenous component. That income, if we use those conventions, uh, then we know that the total income is just the sum of endogenous and exogenous components. Uh, by construction, this is true, because this is just by the, by the column total. And uh, then that's how we get to the beloved uh, relative inverse sum model. And then if we differentiate and we want to know the effects of a change in the exogenous component of an account on the total income, uh, then we know that the answer is given by the inverse matrix. Right? So the inverse matrix, uh, uh, let's say the cell IJ of the inverse matrix, um, IJ, uh, the cell IJ denotes the change in total income of account I, the account on the row, uh, as a result of a unitary shock, the account on the column. Okay? Um, and this matrix is actually the core of the sum model. That's what uh, uh, we do for, uh, is that true? Well, we can go, and actually I did once. I like uh, better to think of the core as the technical coefficient matrix. Uh, that's probably a, a very subtle uh, distinction. So that's the basic, uh, very basic version of the sum model. Now let's see how the tool can be used to prepare the sum for simulations. Um, and this is uh, probably a bit uh, too much work, but you first need any metrics into the tool in order to modify it. So um, let's assume that you have a sum, but you want to aggregate the sum, and you want to use the tool to aggregate it. Well, first you need to input the disaggregated sum, and then you can aggregate. There are the programming reasons to, to do that. Um, so let's see concretely how to, for example, reorder accounts in, the, in a sum. Uh, this, this first uh, block, uh, these are the buttons to define the sum and to prepare it for simulation. Here I'm going to click on uh, reorder sum accounts. And uh, basically what this um, user form allows me to do is to move up or down any single account. And I can make as, any ch as many changes as needed. Um, so for example, let's assume that I want uh, the capital account and the rest of the world account to be endogenous. So I need to move those um, right below households. So that's it, right? This, these are the four categories of households in the sum, and now I need these two accounts to be endogenous too, and everything uh, below is going to be exogenous. So I move the two accounts, and then I click on Done. And now I have an auxiliary uh, sheet that was created by the tool with the reorder metrics. OK? And then I just need uh, to copy and paste, in this case, to uh, this sheet, where the, uh, the sum lives in the tool. So we need to copy and paste to the new uh, to the new sheet. So that is reordering. Uh, you can also aggregate the sum. 
Uh, but in this case, an extra step is needed. You can, you can define up to five aggregations at a time. And by that I mean, so I click on some aggregation. Um, so we have five tabs. We have these five tabs to define aggregations. Um, that means that I can generate five aggregated accounts at a time. It doesn't mean that I can only aggregate five. So I can define, for example, the first variable as the sum of the first 13 activities. That's one new variable. Then the second variable is going to be the sum of uh, activities 17 and 51. Two new variables. I can define up to five. Uh, why? Well, because, uh, believe it or not, writing code for these five tasks so that pushing of the same account into aggregations is not allowed, and things like that is incredibly tedious. That's why I decided to stop at five. Hope that that is not a big restriction for you. So the way this works is you go to one of the tabs and you add, let's say I want that to be a new account and I want to give it the name A prim, for example, and then I go to the second and if this works fine, uh, I'm going to try to get an error message. I'm going to call it a sec. And then it's telling me that this account is also on the list for the first aggregation, right? Which is a problem. Uh, but you see the idea. That's how we aggregate things. So I need to remove this account and probably add a second one. And when I'm done, uh, this is, again, an auxiliary sheet with the aggregate sum. Uh, there's an extra step needed in this case because when I define the sum before aggregation, it had 83 accounts. I don't know how many. Let's say 83, right? But here I did some aggregations, and now the number of accounts is reduced to 78. So I need to tell the tool that now I'm going to use a different sum, which has fewer accounts. So I have to go back to defining a matrix. Okay, and now telling the tool, I don't know, uh, I have 10, but now I have only 12 or 10 activities. And you just copy and paste from, uh, uh, it's probably this one, from here to input matrix again. Yes? <coughs> uh. Need to type it. And the reason is that, uh, I don't know if you tried that. When you define a matrix, I'm not going to do it because I, I don't want to delete all my information. Uh, but there's a lot of things going, going on in the background. And wh what's actually happening is that the inverse matrix, all the decompositions, and all intermediate outputs are being deleted every time you define a new matrix. So before deleting that every time you decide to do an aggregation, I prefer to wait until you're sure that the matrix you have is final in every possible sense. Order is correct, number of accounts is correct, you aggregate it, you did whatever you had to do, and once you know that your sum is final and ready, every single time you make a small change, I have to delete everything. That, that's the reason why. Uh, well, actually, in the yes, in the current version, in the current version, uh, you cannot have a sum that is uh, has more than two hundred. Oh, because of the column, more than fifty six, and then you need to have categories, numbers. Yes. Now I can go around that relatively easily, right? Have you input the matrix correctly or to the 
bring the metrics directly from a file. The problem there is that you won't be able to see your uh, but, but it's easy for me. those versions of any issue. I'm referring to uh, version 2003. Yeah. And it's not it's not a new it's not a version for you have no problem in the word and still no, okay. No, the restriction is imposed by your Excel. Oh, okay. So if you're on Excel with uh, 5,000 columns, then you so can necessarily file 5,000 accounts. 5, 5, 5, account. Yeah. Okay. yeah. It's imposed only by your version oh, okay. of Excel. Yeah. Um, yes. Well, the order, yes, the order is, is the opposite, right? The order is, where is my mouse? The order is you first come here, yes. And then after all the changes are made, you copy and paste the sum from uh, the auxiliary. Yes, yes, you're going to get the, the tool takes you there. The final step, it takes you to this input metrics sheet and it tells you, uh, well, now copy and paste uh, your son. Yeah. So once you're here, you just go back to your auxiliary sheets where the aggregated or reorder sum is, and you copy and paste from there. Yes. Okay. Uh, now balancing. This is a an really unexploited feature feature of the tool, and I would love uh, someone to give it a serious try and. To, to get some feedback. Um, I mean, I've tried it, of course, uh, and I think it works well, but uh, we need real uh, problems being solved using, using these two algorithms. Uh, the tool provides two algorithms to balance, uh, or at least to try to balance uh, a potentially unbalanced, unbalanced sum. One is RAS, and the other one is cross-entropy with restrictions. Uh, I know that there are more algorithms available to balance sums. Uh, I don't have any strong reason to add any other algorithm to the tool right now. And uh, the reason why I pick RAS and cross entropy is because RAS is very common around for a long time. And cross entropy seems to be the method that is most used uh, these days. Um, after you use any of these two algorithms, uh, you get some diagnostics. Differences with respect to the original sum for you to judge if you liked uh, whatever the balancing algorithm did for you. Um, I, I don't have much experience in the construction of sums, but uh, when I, I talk to my colleagues who do, they tell me that balancing a sum is, is an art. It's not something that you just give to guns and get something, you know, uh, as, as an output, and then you work with it. Uh, many times you don't like what the, what the balance algorithm did to you. There are numbers that don't make sense. And then you have to go back and do some, you know, by hand, probably some changes, and give it to the algorithm again. Uh, so this is not supposed to, to That's why we provide diagnosis for you to judge if you like. Uh, what one you have. Um, so the RAS implementation, since it's very old, it's cheap in terms of computing resources. It's quick. 
Uh, all that you need to uh, for this algorithm is um, some weight. Wait, let, let me step back. Oh, this is clear for everyone, but and I hope that I find a piece of chalk. The problem with an imbalanced sum is that uh, you know that these Uh, the problem of an unbalanced sum is that this equality doesn't hold, yeah. right? Uh, so in the Rust method, the only thing you need to, to know is, well, these two numbers are different. You need to set a target for the method to hit. And the target is a weighted average of these two numbers. So the tool, what is the weight? Is a weight of one, meaning the row total is, is my target or give it a, a weight of zero, meaning the column total is my target, or any number uh, between zero and one. Uh, so this is uh, this is what I referred as uh, controls here. Target is probably a better word. Um, and this algorithm is just a scaling method. It's an it iterative. Is that the right pronunciation? Iterative scaling method, right? Yes, it scales uh, and then it compares the, the new totals. If, uh, the, if, the, if they're not close enough, it scales again, and that's how it works. Yes. Uh, again, uh, this is the weighted average of row and, and column total I, I, I referred to. And the, the variable in the tool is called weight. Um, um, and basically how it works is, first the rows are scaled using a formula uh, so that the rows have a certain sum, concretely the target. But then if you scale the rows, that changes the, the, the column total. Uh, so that's why you, you need to check if the row and column totals are equal after scaling. If they're not, now you scale the columns, hit the target. But if you scale the columns, you're changing the row sum. And that's the idea. You go on and go on. Yes? No. No, no. No, that's, that's why on this slide I said that uh, the tool provides two algorithms to balance, or at least to try to balance. Yes, because you might not get convergence. Um, so this uh, process uh, iterates until one of two things happen. happens. Or uh, first, the two totals are close enough, and that is given by the tolerance uh, in the tool. Or after a maximum number of iterations is hit, because you don't want this program to run uh, 53 days. So you say, hey, 10,000 iterations or 20,000 or I don't know how many is enough. If you don't get there after that many iterations, then just stop. So you have set maximum iterations. So let's see, let's see how that works. Let's see how we can balance. Uh, maybe some using the tool. Oh yeah, I created. I created an, a new file, and wh what I did is I used the same sum you all have in the tool, and I perturbed that sum in an arbitrary way. I guess I uh, changed household's final consumption, or no, all the expenditures, uh, multiply that times right. Random number, random number. Uniform. Something like that. I just change consumption uh, 
at most by, by 20%. That's what I did, expenditures. This thing working? Okay, so this is the sum we have here. Uh, and I already checked, let me make this smaller. This is the residual column. As you can see, there are differences in the residual column, right? This sum is, is not balanced. Again, I, I changed the, the household columns arbitrarily. Um, so assuming that these differences come from a real imbalance and not by mistakes I made inputting the data, and let's try to fix those. Uh, and, and also let's assume that I find the difference is too big, right? In, in, in real life, a sum is never balanced in the first place. But you might have relatively small differences. So instead of you know, uh, giving an automatic optimization procedure, uh, the discretion to change the numbers as, as it pleases, sometimes you might say, I can live with those differences. I know where they come from, they're not too big, uncomfortable with the differences. Um, so in this case, I'm going to assume that the differences are just too big. It's almost 10% here. I'm going to say that I'm not happy with the differences. So I'm going to use the tool to balance this sum. So that's the last button on the left. And now I can pick between cross entropy and RAS. So I'm going to try the RAS algorithm. And then these are uh, the three numbers I need to set. Uh, you can read the user's manual to, to know exactly how these, well, this is obvious, but these two numbers are, are defined. This is actually the sum of all the differences. Uh, so actually that number is incredibly low. I should probably change the default. And uh, this is a number between zero and one. I'm going to use 0.5. Uh, just for illustration and for the tolerance level, I don't know, let's try 50, if it works. Yes, so it's telling me that was completed successfully and converged and after 99 iterations. Again, I, I, my maximum was 1,000. 99 is a relatively low number of iterations. Um, and the output was copied to a sheet called Balsam. Okay, again, this is not replacing the information you had in the input metrics sheet. Not yet, because you might not like this. You might decide to do something else. Uh, so this sheet also have here some diagnostics, let's say. So it's telling you that the corresponding column, oh, I'm sorry, this is the column sum, and this is the difference between the column sum and the row sum. 1.6 out of 3,000, very small, and you see all the differences. Okay. Um, no, that's, uh, what is the definition of negligible, but it, this are very small. And uh, so not only that, but usually when you're balancing the sum carefully, you also, uh, you also want to see differences in individual cells, right? It's not only the, 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 the totals. You want to see what happened to certain aggregates or cer certain cells. So if you go far right on, on the sheets in, in the tool, the last two you're going to find are called PERSTIV or PERDIV and VALDIV. PERDIV gives you the percentage change between the balanced and the unbalanced sum for each cell. This cell is now 7.45% uh, higher than before balancing and so on. And you can also see the differences in values. These are the differences in values. Uh, so I think you, should, you have plenty of information to judge, uh, to decide if you like, if you like what the, what the uh, balancing procedure did for you. Um, assuming that you like everything you see here, then again, uh, you need to copy and paste the metrics. 
nothing changed, right? Dimensions stay the same, categories stay the same. So you can simply copy and paste. But the shape of the matrix didn't change. So that's the way to do RAS. Uh, I mean, we can see it's probably because all the all the examples are rigid, right? Whenever you do a presentation, you need everything to work. But let me show you that the thing can fail too. So my tolerance level is just one. Again, uh, you can read the user's manual to see what that means. And the procedure did not converge after 1,000 iterations. I'm just asking the tool to do something that it that cannot do. Well, the tool, no, RAS cannot do in only 1,000 iterations for such a low uh, tolerance level. Okay, but again, it lets you know that it did not converge, and uh, also it reports the last sum in this uh, iterative procedure, right? So this is the last thing it tried before aborting. So you have some intermediate output uh, that you might find useful. So that is RAS. Um, there are some uh, criticisms to RAS, uh, but the, the one I found most uh, common in the literature is that in some cases the differences between the unbalanced sum and the balanced sum are just too big. Uh, some differences that don't make sense, at least in economic terms. Uh, and and that's, that's the main complaint I, I, I have found. Um, now the cross entropy with restrictions, um, the story the story of this, of this algorithm for the tool is nice, it's really nice because I tried implementing the algorithm myself first. And I tried different you know, uh, optimization methods and I couldn't get it right because it was just too slow. I was balancing a 12 by 12 matrix and it was taking like five minutes. Imagine for a 200 by 200 matrix which you have, commonly have it was simply not feasible. So at some point I gave up. I said, well, nice idea, but not feasible for the tool. And then I found uh, this implementation by Flynn and, uh, how do you pronounce this? Flynn and Greff. Uh, they have a code written in 1997. Actually, they wrote a paper with the code. Uh, it's based on a theorem by these guys, 1981. And they use this theorem to do numerical implementation of the cross entropy with restrictions. And they saved uh, my life at that moment. Uh, so I'm using their implementation in the tool. Um, and this is basically how it goes, the, the cross entropy algorithm. Uh, don't ask me to explain the logarithm because uh, this uh, Artus professor on uh, during the plenary, opening plenary session couldn't explain it, and he's a physicist. So I won't even try. But let's assume that this is the uh, balanced sum, T, and the unbalanced sum is T bar. So this function computes, in some sense, the distance between these two. And this is the function that, that computes the distance. Uh, so as you can see, if uh, the balanced sum is exactly equal to the unbalanced, meaning the original was balanced, then this is 1 and the natural logarithm of 1 is 0. And the distance will be 0. Any difference between these two sums is going to add to the distance function. Uh, so we're trying to minimize that. We want to minimize the distance to balance the sum, but in such a way that the differences with respect to the original sum are as small as possible. That is the idea. Um, now the nice thing about this algorithm is that in the RAS algorithm, we just set a target, right? We just set a weighted average of these two numbers as a target. And then we try to hit it by scaling uh, iteratively. 
Well, in, in the construction of a SAM, uh, many times I trust more some aggregates or some information than others, right? Usually if it is the case, for example, that the trade information is pretty reliable. You don't want a balanced algorithm to play around with your trade information. Or what we do, right? The trade authority tells me that where the imports, you know, those are the imports. What happens with the GDP? Uh, I might not believe uh, the stock formation numbers, but the aggregate GDP is something I would like to keep as it is. I need some balancing algorithm to cut it in half. So this algorithm allows us to do exactly that. We can minimize this distance function by imposing constraints. One constraint could be, well, don't change the GDP too much. I like the GDP figure I have. Uh, don't, don't mess around with it. Or I like the import figure I have. Don't change the total imports. Or well, I don't know. You, you see what, what is the point, right? We can impose constraints to the balancing algorithm. Um, and the tool can handle any constraint that can be written in a linear way. If you have a constraint that says the GDP times uh, household consumption should be less than something, this is not the tool for you. You need to use GAMS or something else to balance your sum. But most of the restrictions that you would like to impose are linear, right? Is the sum. Or, uh, total amount paid to labor, its final consumption of households, is aggregate GDP, is uh, trade balance, right? Those are linear conditions. So anything that can be written as a linear constraint can be handled by the tool. Um, so again, I perturb the original uh, Tanzania sum. And uh, in the perturbed sum, this is the figure for GDP. And this is the figure for household's final consumption. OK? So I'm going to assume that in that case, I truly believe that that data is good. And I don't want it to be changed too much. So I'm going to impose very tight bounds on what the balancing algorithm can do with those two aggregates. In the case of GDP, I'm going to impose these limits between 580 and 585, and for the household consumption between 500 and 550. Okay, so again, the balancing algorithm in principle can do anything, but in the end, I need these two aggregates to lie within these two intervals. Okay, so let's see how we do that. We go back to the main sheet, balance sum, and then we pick a cross entropy. Um, is there anything really important there? Probably not. Not incredibly important, but let's see. The parameters. Again, you need to read the user's manual to see exactly what these parameters mean. Um, and uh, we can also do stochastic uh, cross entropy. I'm not going to talk about that. Uh, but everything is explained in the manual. I hope that, that the explanation is clear. So those are some parameters that are used. And here is where we select the GDP. And I gave the GDP a dedicated tab because again, in the literature, I found that people trust the GDP estimates. And they like to fix or to bound what the algorithm can do in terms of GDP. So this is how you do it. Uh, you select the range in a single column that defines GDP or value added. In this case, is the remuneration to the factors, right? Single column finger column. Um, and then I impose the, the, impose the bounds here. So I don't know what numbers I said I was going to use. 
7580 and 7585. So 7580, 7585, uh, uh, and update, uh, update my constraints list, and it's showing me that I have that constraint in GDP. And then I go to one of these tabs, let's say const1, and define now the range for the aggregate. My aggregate is final household consumption, and that is right here. This is final household consumption, right? The intersection of commodities and households, okay? And then the numbers I'm going to use for the bounds is 500 and 5550. Now update the constraint list. Oh, I can even uh, give a sensible name to that, household final consumption, for example. And now it's showing me all the restrictions I have. Um, I could, in principle, impose, I'm not going to do that, and, and be careful what you hope for, you could impose uh, restrictions on sales, actually on all sales, but that might take a month to run. Uh, so I'm not going to do that. And once I'm uh, done with the restrictions, I click on done, and I hope it works. I checked this morning, so it should work. After 62 iterations, it converged. And again, it's showing me uh, same thing as before. What is it? Some other stuff for st stochastic things. Here is telling me what is the estimated value and what were the lower and upper bounds that I imposed. Okay. Again, you can find diagnostics in the last two sheets on the right, percentage and values. Uh, but this is, this is basically how it works. So once you like that, again, you just copy and paste your balanced sum. Good. So that's it for preparing the sum. Now we're going to assume that you did everything you had to do and the sum is in a final shape. Start working. So after you input the sum, after you input the sum, uh, there are things that are, com are computed uh, automatically. The row and column sums, of course, because we already checked balance. Uh, also, the technical coefficients metrics and the macro sum are computed automatically. Uh, and those two are here. There's one sheet called macro sum. And this macro sum uses, again, the, cut, the categories that you defined when designing the metrics, right? So see, see here, it aggregated all that you call activities. You said 15 accounts, it aggregates the 15 accounts and generates that, uh, that aggregate, and the same is true for the rest of the sum. Okay, this is the macro sum, your macro sum. So this is useful because here you can check quickly the aggregates that you know and love, right? So you, you clearly or quickly can know if, some, if something is wrong. I know that this is GDP, the sum of these three numbers. So if that doesn't match what I know the GDP should be, then there might be an issue with the data input or some other issue and also some uh, technical coefficients for the macro sum. And this is purely descriptive, but it, it's quick and is, and is useful. Um, you can also do uh, quickly some descriptive analysis of incomes and expenditures for the different categories you define. So let's say you want to know 
what is the income and exp expenditure structure for households, let's say. So you click on household, select both because you want both income and expenditure. Uh, you need to give a name for the sheet with the results. And this tells you uh, total income. So these categories of households, the first one, it's rural poor, 64.5% uh, of their income comes from labor, 20% from capital, and so on. And this is the structure for expenditures. This is aggregate again. Um, uh, so this is auto consumption. This is final consumption. And apparently there's nothing else there. No, there should be. Yes, this expenditure, this probably taxes paid, savings in percentages, right? Purely descriptive. You, you could do this uh, without the tool, but again, this is, this is quick and easy. Okay. Auto consumption. Uh, when you have households that, uh, in, in rural areas, this is typical. And uh, they uh, cultivate maize, but they eat half of the crop. The right place to, to report that our consumption is from uh, or zero. Developing countries, this is this is important. Um, labor multipliers uh, might have. So the way to do it is uh, for labor multipliers, you need two things. You need the figure for aggregate employment. Of course, you don't get that from the sum. And you also need the number of jobs generated by each currency unit that the sum is ex expressed in. So in this case, I'm working in billion shillings. So if from a household survey or some other source, I know how many jobs are generated in the activity, then I can easily compute those numbers. How are these numbers used? Well, when you design experiments, uh, it computes, again, using uh, linear linear assumption, it computes the change in the number of jobs as a result of any shock. Okay. Um, go back. Okay. The compute inverse matrix uh, button is, is really, really powerful. And uh, I just want you to be aware that the first time you click on any button in the tool that requires MATLAB, uh, things might take a bit longer, right? So if you open the tool and for the first time you input uh, the data and for the first time you click on compute inverse matrix, it might take between 10 and 20 seconds to version. I don't know if this is the first time I'm going to click on this today. It is. So you see that it's taking you know, a bit of time uh, the reason is that the tool is loading the MATLAB components for the first time. So that takes longer. But if I click on that button again, it should take less time. Okay, so the first time you hit a button that requires MATLAB, uh, be a bit patient, 10, 20 seconds. Um, so as, I, as I was saying, this is a very powerful button um, not only it computes the core of, of everything, which is the inverse matrix, but it does uh, several decompositions and additional uh, analysis. Some of those, well, one of those is this additive decomposition uh, suggested by Piat and Round. Uh, basically, what they try to do is they have the multiplier, um, and they try to see how much of the total multiplier is explained by interaction of accounts in the same group. And now you remember the three colored groups uh, when defining a sum. 
So how much is explained for, uh, by interactions within the group? How much is explained by interactions inter groups? And how much is explained by the rest, which is all the feedback and uh, everything else? And this is the decomposition, the additive decomposition. This is called the transfer effect, open loop effect, and closed effect. Um, and that is reported. Did I say that? Yes. Everything, th that decomposition, including the portion of or the share of the multiplier that is explained by the closed loop, that is referred usually to indirect effects, everything is reported on the inverse sheet. So when you go there, you will find the inverse matrix is the first matrix you find on top. Uh, so of course each cell has the corresponding multiplier. Then right below you have the additive decomposition. The first one is the transfer effects, the next one open loop effects, and the closed loop effects. And you also have the closed loop effect as a share of the total, of the total multiplier. So these, uh, these auxiliary metrics gives you quickly the, explain, the share of the multiplier that is explained by indirect effects. Probably computing, yes, multipliers as elasticities. Uh, that's a curiosity more than anything else. So you have all those numbers in case you need them. It also computes economic linkages. Um, and the linkages are usually related to the identification of key sectors in an economy. And even though the traditional uh, linkages indices are, are well accepted, um, there's also some controversy on, on how to measure linkages correctly. The reason is that uh, when you have a relationship between a buyer and a seller, and that's usually the terms uh, that we use when thinking about SAMs, the transactions in the SAM, uh, it can be regarded as the buyer's uh, direct backward linkage to the seller and the seller's direct forward linkage to the buyer. So, in other words, when you try to measure either backward or, for or forward linkages, there's some of the other that is somewhere in the computation. I cannot measure pure backward linkages or pure forward because I have some, in the case of backward, I have some forward in the computation. That, that's, that's the problem. Um, and the way I like to think about this so that I don't forget what's the difference is backward linkages refer to, probably have a slide with that definition, yes. Forward linkages uh, the word forward or backward talks about the position of the sector in a chronological sense. That's the way I think about it, so that I, I don't forget. So if I'm talking about forward linkages, it's because the sector I'm, I'm talking to is ahead. So the other sectors are affecting. Talking about. Uh, and it is an index because that is expressed relative to the average effect in the economy. The average for all other sectors. Uh, and when I'm thinking about backward linkages, I like to think of the sector being behind in a, some chronological sense. Uh, so he's pushing other sectors in the economy. So forward linkages refer to the ability of a sector to be pushed or uh, activated, and backward refers to the ability of this sector to push other sectors in the economy. And a key sector is defined usually as a sector that can both push and be pushed, right? You want a sector that is responsive to shocks in the economy, but you also want a sector that is able to push and generate activity in other sectors in the economy. So whenever you have um, backward and forward linkages indices greater than one, both, 
then you, you call that sector a key sector. And the computation is, is presented in the key sectors sheet. So let's go there. Again, this is done when you click on the inverse, compute inverse metrics. So this is a graphical representation of, of the key sectors. Uh, so on the vertical axis, we have forward linkages. Remember this is an index, so it goes from uh, zero to, on the horizontal axis, we have backward linkages. Um, and then always this grid or cross that you're going to see denotes the one for both axes. That is, is graphically clear that anything on this quadrant can be considered a key sector. And uh, in this case, numbers are used. Remember that the tool numbers the account? So you need to go back and see what account is, what activity, what sector is number one, number 13, and number four, but it's probably agriculture and who knows what else. Uh, these sectors right here are backward oriented, meaning higher than average uh, backward linkages, uh, but lower forward linkages. The opposite is true for all the sectors here. That would be forward oriented. And these would be considered weak sectors. Uh, low backward and forward and forward linkages. Uh, you can also, uh, some people object uh, to measuring this without weighting uh, sectors. So if, if you would like some weights, I guess I use GDP to weight sectors here. And the results might change when you weight. That's the only difference between those two graphs. Now again, uh, this contamination issue, when, when measuring backward that there's some forward in the computation, one of the proposals to clean the computation uh, was done by Sonny uh, Gilotto, Hewings, and Martins in 1995. They defined something called the pure linkages, which are not indices anymore. These are measured in monetary terms. Um, Basically, what this does is to clean the, the measurement from own uh, effects created in the, in the same sector, feedback effects, and also uh, the feedback effects from and to, to the sector. That's, that's the way they propose to clean the computation. And this is reported in the linkages sheet. Here it is. Um, so these are the pure backward and forward linkages. I don't have a graph for that. Uh, let me tell you something general about this, this sheet where all the numbers are, are stored. As you can see, every time we compute an index or, or some kind of measurement of linkages, automatically the activity, well, I'm sorry, the accounts in each category are sorted descendingly. So you can quickly identify that this account is the account with the highest backward linkages followed by this one and that the order is different here. We're talking about forward linkages, right? And the same is true for what else? Oh, self-induced, you can read the manual. Weighted linkages, and finally the pure linkages that I just mentioned. Okay? The accounts are sorted automatically descendingly. Uh, if you see the outcome, it should, it should be in work. Uh, you see that the ordering is different from the ordering using the traditional uh, uh, linkages indices. It is ordered, yes, descendingly. So descending order. within activities, this is descending in the value of the pure backward linkages? Descending. descending, always, yes. Why? Uh, well, because it is not ascending. Right. I mean, I don't have a good explanation, but I think it's useful to, to, see, to see them uh, in, in descending order. Actually, for everything. 
for everything. Uh, don't ask me to interpret all the computations, but if you need them, uh, then they're there. Uh, yeah, if you can see here, even the households, the linkage, everything is, is, is computed there, yeah. Um, now another interesting question, probably an overstatement, that the two co can help to answer is what happens to the relative income in an economy after a shock? And by relative income, I mean, uh, let's assume that agriculture accounts for 20% of the total income in the economy. Is it true that after I shock the oil sector, uh, agriculture is still going to account for 20 or is it going to be higher or low? That's uh, the relative I'm uh, referring to. And then I, I'm using uh, both Roland Holst and Sancho contribution in 1992 and Yopan Manresa in 2004. And uh, that is produced, yes, I'm glad I didn't, I, I don't say anything else about it. Uh, here, there's this uh, sheet called Inc. Redist, Income Redistribution. And uh, this basically tells us if I shock the account on the column, how is the relative income of the account on the row affected? If I shock agriculture, uh, its own income, relative income, is going to increase by that much. And those are percentages, so these are really tiny, They're unitary shops, right? It's one unit, one currency unit. It's, that's why those numbers are small, but uh, you could see quickly without paying too much attention to the values that if I shock agriculture, uh, the relative income of other manufacturing is going to decrease, same is true for equipment, and you can go deeper into the values and also decomposition. There's an additive decomposition to that metrics explained in these two papers and the user's manual that uh, basically decomposes the, the final change in uh, the relative position before the shock and then some net multiplier. And that is presented there too. You see the relative position metrics and the net multiplier effect. Uh, again, you can, you can read the user's manual or the, or the original papers. Um, now, I think this is a cute question. Um, um, we asked this question uh, several times. When you, when you have a sum, uh, you might ask yourself, well, if I'm going to have some money as a government, where do you want to invest this money? What sectors would you like to invest? Um, so what is the sector that gives you the highest bang for your buck, right? So there's an, a very easy way to, to do that using the tool. Uh, you go, we go back to the main sheet, and here we click on this button, sector growth and price impacts. I'm not going to talk about price impacts, but this, what, the, what this does is as a percentage of aggregate GDP, if you apply a uniform shock to all the sectors, what is the effect that that's going to have? Again, one at a time, right? Let's say 1% of aggregate GDP to agriculture. What is the change in GDP? Then do it for manufacturing, change in GDP. Uh, trade, change in GDP. And then compare all those numbers, right? In principle, if you have 20 sectors, you have to design 20 experiments and then compare the results. So this is a quick way to do the same thing. You say 1% of aggregate GDP, right? And this is, this is, these are the final results. Uh, so this is uh, sorted descendingly by contribution to GDP, right? This is percentage change of GDP as a result of the shock for this is probably livestock, agriculture, trade, and so on. And on the right hand axis, uh, we're also reporting elasticities. Because um, if you have a sector that is the smallest sector in the economy, then assuming that you can shock that sector 1% of our relative size matters. 
Uh, so that's why we compute levels, which is these uh, shaded bars. Okay, it's not readable by the tool, it should be. And that's percentage change of GDP. So 1%, if I do a 1% of aggregate GDP shock in livestock, the final change in GDP that I get is 3.1. Okay. But expressed as an elasticity, I shock livestock 1% of its production. What is the percentage change that I get in GDP? Might be a, a more meaningful question for some of you. Then the, oh, sorry, the answer is 0.25. The point of livestock that I shock, I get a 0.25 increase. So the hollow bars are elasticities and are right here. The shadow, the shaded bars are right here and are percentage changes of GDP. Okay? Again, it, it's simple, but I think it's, it's cute. Um, good. Then the price model, quickly. Um, the price model. Uh, if you remember the schematic representation we had at the beginning, of today's session, these we have some the endogenous block and we have then exogenous payments. We're going to go down the column adding terms. So if we do that, just payments, that's what we get. Uh, final expenditure is equal to the endogenous block plus the exogenous block. And I'm assuming that we have n endogenous accounts. Um, so now all I'm going to do, well, uh, it's not me, it's uh, and, uh, Flair, probably. This is what I, I, where I, I drew this from. Then um, I'm going to write value as the product of price times quantity. Um, and that is what we get. Then we divide, divide both sides by quantities. Uh, and we get an equation that is actually going to use physical technical coefficients. Not value technical coefficients are we used, as we are used to. Uh, we used physical technical coefficients. This is the equation we get. You can see that it's very, very similar to the value-based model uh, that we all know. Um, but the problem is that the physical technical coefficients are rarely available, right? So this uh, doesn't seem to be a very useful equation. Um, and the interpretation of the equation is simply that the final price of uh, good in sector J is just a weighted average of prices of all the goods that the sector buys, right? And some exogenous payments, taxes or, or imports. Um, so if, you, if we uh, do that, yes. Uh, that is the solution to that system of equations, right? It looks pretty much like the Leon TF uh, value-based model talked about earlier. Yes. A. They're denoted A matrix, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, right now they are. Because right now they are because this is supposed to be a matrix of physical technical coefficients, not value. Uh, well, I actually expressed value of, as P times Q, yeah. right? Uh, but then I divided value, value by Q. Yeah. Yes. So I get physical technical coefficients. Are not the same. Not right now. But they do I'm going there. Right. Yes. But right now, this is a matrix of physical technical coefficients, yeah. right? Again, these are only rarely available. Uh, so it doesn't seem to be very useful to have such an equation. 
but then, according to Miller and Blair, uh, you can also you can give a physical interpretation to the value technical coefficients, right? And the way they do it is to define this technical coefficient as let's say dollars worth of output as their physical measure. Um, and if they use that interpretation, then the physical measure would be equivalent to the monetary measure, right? Uh, one implication of this assumption is that all prices are equal to one. Uh, but now the equation can be written like this. And now this is the same matrix. It's just the transpose. Yes. Is it normalized? Yes, it's a normalization. Yes. In the price model, uh, in the benchmark, all prices are equal to one. Um, and now this is the same technical coefficient matrix as we had before. It's just the transpose. And this is the solution to the to the price model. So we went from a physical uh, technical coefficient matrix, which was not very useful to the value technical coefficient. Price model, right? Going before with the sum model, I was explaining changes in value. I'm exchanging Price is my right. Yeah. Right. C, C. Yes. Yes. Right. It, it that the Yes. Basically basically what we're doing here is giving a physical interpretation to the value technical coefficient. That's what we're doing. So by doing that, we can say, well, then the physical technical coefficient. That, that, that's all we did. That's all we did. Okay, so this is basically the price model. It's just the transpose of the of the value uh, based model. Um, and let's see now how we can design experiments for either the value model or the price model. Uh, you can simulate using the tool any combination of shocks to exogenous components, any. You can shock all the accounts uh, by the same percentage, different percentage, one account, three accounts, anything you, you, you want to do, you can do it easily. Uh, and the effects on production, GDP, employment, if you provided the, the labor multipliers before running the experiment, you're gonna get all those numbers as, as the as outcome. And also a summary graph is produced. Not very useful, the graph, but let's, let's, do, let's do that. Let's see how to simulate something here. So the, the order here is important. If you don't compute the inverse matrix, you cannot do simulation. So first, compute the inverse matrix. But right after you do that, you can come here and uh, let's uh, design an exper experiment for the value-based model. We need a name for this. It would, we're, we're going to store. So here, this is suggesting us to write a title, of a brief description for the experiment in the upper left cells. Again, this is uh, just good practice. 
you usually do several simulations, several sectors, different percentages. So if the name of the sheet is, in this case, AA1, uh, it's clear for you now. But tell me if you have to go back to that file in a year, and then you see AA1. So good practice, write something here. Like, uh, for example, we're going to shock uh, agriculture, agricultural exports uh, by 10%. Increase is, is actually better than shock. Shock is anything. Okay. Uh, and there are two ways to do it. Let me size of this thing. Okay, so ways to do it, if you want to do like I propose here that we increase the uh, agricultural exports by 10%, that's one account, six percent. So that's quick. Or even if you want to do increase all exports by 10%, right? If it's a single percentage, then there's a very quick way to do it, or I would like to think that it is very quick. Uh, you come here, you bring or you copy from the SAM sheet the value of the exports, which is what you want to shock here, right? And then you copy. These are the accounts you want to shock, original values. This is not the value of the shock. And then you write here the percentage. And that's it, right? This percentage is applied to every single value from this column. So I said that agriculture only, but I wanted to show you that this works quickly for several accounts. Okay, now we have agriculture only. Okay, uh, but let's assume that uh, on top of that, no, 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 let's read the, the results first. So this column, total income, impact in production or income, for every single account in the SAM, this is the change in value as a, as a result of the shock. Okay? This is expressed as a percentage of total income of each account. Right? Uh, then on the right, we have, uh, well, total impact in, in terms of GDP for each of the sectors. Then as a percentage of each sector's GDP, and on the right, we have the change in labor using the labor multipliers that you provided, right? This is total. Total. Is it possible to I'm just trying to understand the, 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 the composition. We are using Yeah. Basically, we are using the total. Right. So, there is that. First down is equal to that. There is a second down is equal to the inputs that you put to other sectors, so I can take and so on and so on. So ultimately you are printing the total of the jacket. Right. I, if I am interested to know the total to be decomposed, it is components. Right. So Yes it is. Now if, if I understood correctly yes. what you want to do. Uh, one answer to that question is, is given by the structural path analysis. Yes. 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 We, yes. 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 It is possible, and we will do that. I don't know if today uh, I'm sh running short of time, but uh, and then well, the, the, then there are other things reported. You can you can read uh, later. Yes. Yeah. 
income parties, for example, households, right? Ah, okay. Yeah, households don't, well, you don't call that production. Yeah, yeah so, yeah. But it, it yeah, it's probably not a, I, I haven't been able to find a, a neutral word that can describe all the accounts, so, yeah. And just in case you're interested, there's a uh, aggregate, the percentage in, in aggregate GDP, too, is reported. And there are some other things that you can, you can then read. We decompose the final effect using the technical coefficient metrics, and we also decompose the final effect using these uh, decomposition between open loop transfer and, and closed loop. But that's basically, basically the way you, 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 you uh, design experiments. So if you know the value, for example, of a shock, you want to increase transfers to households, uh, rural poor households by government in an amount equal to 50 billion shillings, then you just type the number, right? If you know the exact size of the shock, you can simply type it on the E column and then it's added. No, no, value, value, yes. This percentage applies to values here. Right? Uh, so if you know the value of the shock exactly, you can simply type it. This additional, additional, yes. So uh, as you can see, the, the numbers change automatically. So it's easy, it's very easy to, to, do, to do simulations. Um, structural path. Um, I'm afraid that we're, I'm going to stop unless you have 15 minutes. What do, you, what do you think? You have 15 minutes? Alejandro? You do? Great, uh, because I wouldn't like to stop in, in, in the middle of this. This is, this is really, it's a beautiful application, I think. So as, as, as you were saying, sometimes the final effect is not enough when doing policy analysis, right? Uh, it might be the case, for example, that when going from an origin account to a destination account, the effect is small because there's a bottleneck, right, on way. Or, uh, or it could be that simply everything is small along the way and that's the reason why the final result is small. Not only that, I want to know the exact path that this shock travels through in the economy, right? I know that it starts in agriculture, somehow it gets to households, but what accounts are affected on the way? How it unravels uh, through the economy? And that is exactly what is done by structural path analysis. Um, so the starting point is the metrics of technical coefficients. Uh, the technical coefficients are going to give the intensity of paths connecting to accounts. Uh, so in principle, any endogenous account can be considered a pole or a node uh, in the analysis. Then two poles are connected by an arc only if the technical coefficient is greater than zero, right? And the intensity of the arc is given by, by the value of the technical coefficient, okay? Now a sequence of consecutive arcs defines a path so if I can go from one account to the other, uh, always having positive values for the technical coefficients, it means that these two accounts can be connected, right? Um, an elementary path is one that goes from one account to the other without repeating, because I'll show you a diagram. Um, this diagram. This is the key, I, I, I'm taking this from Cheng, probably. Someone else did the diagram for me. I mean, not for me, but it is published. So this is what uh, structural path analysis is about. Let's assume that I want to connect or see the connection between account I and account J. There are many ways, and I'm assuming that all these technical coefficients, there are some typos there, technical coefficients are positive, right? So we we can in fact connect these accounts. So there are several ways to go from an I to J. One way is from I to K to M to J. That is one way to do it. 
Another way to do it is I, K, M, K, M, J. Another way to do it, I, K, M, F, K, M, J. Another way to do it, I, K, M, F, K, M, K, M, J. And you see the idea, right? right. In principle, there's an infinite number of ways to go from I to J, because I can look here an infinite number of times, well, no, infinite is, is, after an infinite number, I cannot go to, but you get the idea. Um, so this is a path. Any, any, any of these combinations that I described is a path, but there's only one elementary path. That is I, K, M, J. That's the only way in which I can go from I to J without repeating accounts. So that defines an elementary path. Um, so what it is called the direct influence along that path is simply given by the intensities. Intensities, remember, are uh, technical coefficients. So if I go elementary, I can repeat I, K, M, J. The direct influence is given by the product of these three technical coefficients the ones I use along the elementary path. That's called direct influence. Oops. Um, but I can have, as you saw, more ways to go from one account to the other. Um, so after one round, let me see if I can get this right. Yes. I'm not using it. I'm just uh, using what they use in the literature. Yes, so in the literature is known as elementary path. Yes. Um, but after one round, I can go again from here. Yes. Elementary is not a bad name, I think. Uh, so again, I could go after one round from here, I, K, M, K, M, J. Right, or I, and I can repeat that many times, looping here, especially, or here through F. Um, so I can probably not, I'm not going to try to get the equations right. I, I should, I'm sure the equations are right, but if I try to explain every single term, I might spend more time than needed. But the idea is that um, after T rounds, this looks like a geometric series, right? Uh, there's some way to guarantee that this is lower than one, this is less than one. Uh, I, when I did this a long time ago, I, I knew exactly why, but now I can't remember. The fact is that this is a geometric series and we know that the geometric series converges. And we use that fact uh, to write um, arrive to this final expression, which is the total influence that travels along the path from I to J, using the path P, is given by the product of the direct influence, which is the product of the three, in this case, um, technical coefficients times some multiplier. And the multiplier is given by all these possible uh, loops that, that I can do before getting to the final destination. This is a technicality. Okay, now how to do it using the tool. And, and I'm, uh, I'm proud about this. All paths of length at most 11 can be computed using the tool. Now, careful what you wish for, because it might take a day or two to compute all possible paths of length 11. And not only that, I, I've, I've never found a sum uh, justifies the use of paths When I try and I wait for a long time, I never get anything interesting. Uh, means the elementary path, like 11. That means that you can have 50 power accounts.
this is the length of the elementary path. Some people used to, or, or told me actually, one of the things make any sense to, to do elementary paths of length more than two or three. But it's not true. There, there are certain sounds that has a certain structure that if you don't do at least four, you might be missing very important. Actually, this is probably one of the cases. No, but this is an optimized. Author is a guy uh, by the last name Pablo. He works for the World Bank. <laughs> yes. Uh, I, I use some sparse matrices techniques to optimize this computation, and, and one of the reasons why I, I'm, I'm so proud about this, and the, uh, until someone else proves that I'm wrong or that. I, I'm, I'm very inefficient, is that if you, you, if you use brute force to do this computation, the number of cases you need to consider is close to n cubed. n is the number of endogenous accounts. So let's use 100, which is a fairly common number. It's uh, 100 uh, cubed. Uh, but of course, I don't do that. I, I, I do something that is uh, much more efficient. And uh, let's see how this works. There are three ways in which you can do structural path analysis. You can start with one single account and knowing that you want to study the effect of, on one account, right? So you know that you want to shock agriculture and you want to see the effect on rural poor households, right? Only two accounts. So you, fig, uh, you, you pick the first option and then you do agriculture. Well, actually if it exports is here, agriculture, sorry agriculture, and then you do rural poor households, for example. Uh, this is the maximum length that you want to consider. So again, carefully, if you do 10, it might take a day. So let's do four, which is sensible in this case. And uh, this is for the output. You probably don't want an output with 500 elementary paths, right? Because most of them are going to be negligible. So here you impose a, a threshold. Anything that it doesn't account for at least 1% of the multiplier shouldn't be reported. Okay, that's a, a way to shorten the, the output. Uh, and then you click on Analyze, and this is what you get. Uh, this is the origin account, destination, size of the multiplier, this is the decomposition of transfer open loop and closed effects, right? And then you go and analyze elementary paths. Again, this is just uh, re-reporting the accounting multiplier that in, in the structural path analysis is called global influence, right? And then the elementary paths, let me make it a bit shorter or smaller. Okay, um, are sorted, the elementary paths are sort of descendingly according to the percentage of the multiplier that travels along that path. So always the first path you see is the most important. Okay, and this is how you should read uh, these, this output. Uh, the elementary path that goes from commodity agriculture to activity agriculture, then pays for subsistence factor, this type of labor and capital, and finally goes to rural poor households, has this direct influence, this is the path multiplier, the total influence that travel along that path, and this is this total influence expressed as a percentage of the multiplier. So 40% of the multiplier travels along this elementary path. Okay, remember there might be many loops. Actually, th th there are many because the, the path multiplier is relatively high. It's relatively big. So there are many loops uh, along this elementary path. And then the second path is described there, accounts for 21% 20, uh, of the multiplier and so on. Okay, that's the way you should read th that output. 
Now, you can also do, uh, which I think is nice, is let's assume that you want to study the effects again on rural poor households. But now you want to analyze all the, all the activities or, or all possible export shocks, right? So the destination account is fixed, is rural poor households, but now you want to see, to study all the commodities, right, at the same time. Hope it doesn't take too long. Then you get a report for, as you can see, the destination is always the same. But here I'm shocking, the first, the first case I'm shocking agricultural exports, livestock exports, or any kind of shock, demand shock, uh, mining, food, and so on. So all the, all the possible shocks to commodities are analyzed at the same time. And you can do it the other way around. I want to shock agricultural exports, but then I want to compare the effects on different types of households, right? So in that case, you, you pick the fixed origin option um, here, fixed origin. So remember the origin is agricultural exports. And the destination is all possible households, type of households, okay? And this is, this is the result. Right? This is how a shock from agricultural exports go to rural poor households, to rural non poor households, and so on. But the interpretation is always the same. The, 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 the way we should read the, the outcome is always the same. Okay? Um, one caveat about, about this output, you need to move to copy the output somewhere else. Because every time you run it, it's overriding whatever is there. So if here you were doing uh, all households, and now you, oh, and this is for example agriculture, and now you want to do livestock, then copy this thing somewhere else, save it somewhere else, just, just these numbers, and, and do the, the other sector. Otherwise, it's gonna be overwritten. You're going to lose this. Yes, Juliana. Uh, well, let's see. You, uh, so let's do fixed origin, fixed destination. So you want agriculture to livestock, for example? Is that what you want? You want agriculture and manufacturing, right? That's fine. Uh, let's do four, even though four might not be sufficient. Well, it was. It was, yes. Again, the, the real restriction is the connect, connectedness of two accounts, right? Uh, if you happen to pick, is that possible in theory, two accounts that are not connected? Correctly, I don't know if that's possible in theory, but let's assume it is. Uh, then I'm hoping that the algorithm is going to tell you I can find nothing, right? There's no paths, nothing. Uh, I've, never f I've never faced that case, but I'm hoping that the algorithm will tell you something about it, if, if, if that is feasible. Yeah, yes. Right, so the answer is given by the structure of your sum, right? Basically what I do every time I have a new sum is to think, okay, I want to go from activities to households. So according to the structure of this sum, in how many steps can I get there, right? So activities buy from, uh, or commodities buy from activities, activities pay factors, factors my potential, they pay enterprises, if, if the link, right? And then enterprises pay household, right? How many I need? How many do I need minimum? Four, five, three? 
And increasing the, the length is more like a peer, theoretical curiosity, right? Just a programmer, or at least a project of programmer, that is trying to push the boundary of, of what. I don't know if there's much economic meaning. Honestly, and I've never found anything interesting actually of that length. So the structure of the sum, I would say, determines the number you should use for the length of the elementary parts. Yes. It's exa it is exactly given by the product of these technical coefficients. Column row, column row, column row, column row. That product is exactly equal to this number. Ooh, probably is the other way around. It's actually agriculture pain. Yes. Column row. Column row, column row. Yes, the, the order here denotes payments. The first account pays the second account. No, this is not true here, right? No, not here. It yes. Really yes, yes. But structural path always analyzes a unitary shock here. How does it affect here? Right? There's no possibility of combining. At least I'm not aware of that. Combining shocks. Yeah. Um, let's see. That's probably all I have for today. But let's. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for staying longer. Um, um, if anyone wants to to me to to help you with the installation, I have any issues and have time, I can stay here with you. Uh, okay, yeah, that's fine. And otherwise, I'll see you all tomorrow at two. Yes. Pero no, me, lo voy a percibir yo ni siquiera. Eh, hay cositas que funcionan un poquito mejor. Bueno, nada, pues, casualmente me han cambiado el ordenador del despacho hace dos semanas. Ajá. Instalaré el nuevo.